We live in strange times, don't we? Amen. It's just weird. Uh, when you look at uh, uh, the, the visual that I had this morning, uh, and those online, you can't see it the way I see it, but I look around and I see uh, a bunch of people that I love dearly, uh, that I've known many of you for uh, almost two decades, and you're wearing a mask. And I'm not going to say a mask looks good on you. I'm not going to say that. But you might say that about me. I, we, we live in strange times. Uh, for the very first time, we're able to gather together in small groups with six feet of social distance and uh, children uh, gathered in uh, our new children's area, uh, formerly known as Fellowship Hall. They're gathering there, and they gathered, and they, uh, they were distanced by hula hoops. Uh, we're doing more things online than we've ever done, and the reason is because we haven't been able to get together. We've got more people watching us through uh, the digital technology that we have than we have in the room today. We live in strange times. It's not just here. It's everywhere. Uh, we live in strange times in our nation, strange times around the world. Uh, and if you doubt that, just watch football. It's, it's a weird thing to watch coaches having to remember to put on their masks. There was one coach that hooked his masks, mask yesterday uh, to his uh, headset so that as he was coaching, he automatically had that mask come on his face. Uh, it, it's, it's strange. It's difficult. Uh, I mean, who would have ever thought that uh, Big Ten football would not have happened yet? I, who would have ever thought that uh, Tennessee would be 2-0? and I, It is 2020. It's crazy days, right? I, just strange. The Cowboys, uh, NFL, they're, they're just playing normal, uh, one and two. But anyway, we... We live in difficult days, and many people are calling this our new normal, right? You've heard that phrase, haven't you? The new normal. What is our new normal? Um, well, this is it. I mean, we're not sure what's going to remain and what's going to go away. We, we're, we're pretty confident that eventually we won't be wearing masks when we sing uh, or when we get into a room. We're pretty confident that that's going to happen at some point in time. Uh, but there are other aspects of where we are today that will remain, both good and not so good. Strange days. Our new normal is different. But friends, please understand that God has purposed this new normal for us so that we, his people, his church, this family, might be more intent on fulfilling the mission that he's given us. And by the way, it's the same mission that it's always been. We're starting a new series today. Really, we're leaning into some of the last words that Jesus said. We're looking at the mission of the church. We kind of began it last week. Pastor Tim preached Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, and talked about our blessed purpose. And, and in that purpose, we see our mission um, and, and today we're going to kind of launch this new, uh, this new series. And, and when Jesus speaks, he's speaking about the priority of the church. And, and, and I think maybe if we will get our eyes off ourselves long enough to look at the king we say we serve and worship, maybe, maybe we'll lean in a little bit more diligently a little bit more purposefully to the why of our church. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus is sharing last words with his disciples. He's uh, died on a cross for sinners like you and me so that we might find forgiveness for our sin as he died in our place and for our sin. 
He, he, he's been raised from the dead. Three days after his crucifixion, he's raised from the dead so that we might see the victory that he purchases through his righteousness, through his holiness, through his obedience to the Father, this resurrection from the dead, which marks a new day for all creation, the day of Christ's victory, the day in which we can live in that victory, where death no longer is uh, the dismal swamp of despair that overwhelms and conquers us, but death has been defeated by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, where sin and the devil and all of hell used to laugh and curse God. Now they know that they have already been beaten by the King of kings and the Lord of lords through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's a new day that is dawned, a day of a new life that we can have through faith in Christ, not merely have forgiveness forgiveness for sin, but a new way of living, a new birth that can take hold our heart and lead us forward as the people of God, as individual followers of Christ, and as the corporate family that God puts together called First Norfolk. And now he meets with his disciples on an appointed unknown hill, and he begins to share with them. He told them, he said, I want you to meet me on a hill outside Galilee, and I want to I share with you some things. So pick up with me in Matthew chapter 28, and let's look at the setting and then the last words. Matthew 28, beginning in verse 16. Then the 11 disciples, they were missing one. Who were they missing? Judas. Now, why were they missing Judas? Yeah, he betrayed Jesus, and he couldn't deal with the guilt, so he killed himself. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, this resurrected, glorified Christ, the one who had defeated death, hell, and the grave, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Now, the some there would be some of the 11. We don't know of anyone else in the room or in the, on the hillside. There were probably others, but, but the some there is specifically applied to the disciples. There were some of the disciples who said, is this really the Jesus that we followed? Some doubted. Verse 18, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority is, has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Jesus gives us our marching orders. In these last words, of Jesus before he ascends to the right hand of the throne of God, he declares to you and me, to the church for every day and every season in new normals or uh, regular normals or different normals, he says to us, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Therefore, as you go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I've taught you and behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. May the last words of Jesus be the first priority of this family of faith. May the last words of Jesus be the first priority of my life. And what is the priority? What are these last words? It's simply that Jesus sets the mission for the church, and that mission is to make disciples. Jesus sets the mission for First Norfolk, and it's been our mission since we were established in 1805. Our mission from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is to make disciples. And it's been the mission of the church since Jesus was resurrected and exalted. And it will be the mission of the church 
through pandemics and plagues, through wars and persecution, through opposition, through good times and bad, when it's sunny outside and when it's raining, the mission of the church remains the same. It has been the same for over two millennia. It is to make disciples. Oh, church, we need to hear this. We need to embrace this. We need to understand this. Our mission is singular. It is to make disciples. I don't know how many of y'all have been to Philadelphia and gone to the, uh, to the harbor there and you've seen the SS United States. It's this m- uh, monster of a ship that was commissioned at the end of World War II. And the United States spent $50 million and a private company added $28 million in order to build this, this humongous ship. And the goal, the reason this ship was commissioned and built in the Newport News dock, the shipbuilding yard, the reason it was built was so that that ship could carry as many as 15,000 soldiers into battle across the Atlantic and get them from Philadelphia or New York, New York Harbor or Norfolk, and get them over to Europe in a speedy period of time. And so they began to build the ship. It was a wartime ship built to carry troops who would do battle in war. It was finished in 1952, and and obviously World War II was over. And so they decided, well, we'll still use this ship. And and, and on its maiden voyage, certainly it, it set records of transatlantic journey from point A to point B. It, it was fast. It was enormous. It, it, it was almost as long as the Chrysler building is tall. It, it was an enormous ship, and it is an enormous ship. But it was a ship built for war. And it became a luxury cruise liner. It became a a novelty act. It, It became a place where people would gather together and they would take a cruise and they would sit on the promenade deck and they would lounge in the sun and they would have a grand old time. They would get on the ship to be entertained. But that wasn't the purpose of the ship. The purpose of the ship was to carry troops to battle. Now, it's a tourist attraction, a museum of sorts. You know where I'm going with this, don't you? Here's the problem with the church. Jesus created the church to be a ship to carry troops into battle, to advance the good news of his rescuing love, to make disciples of all nations, and we have turned the church into a luxury liner for our entertainment. We've turned the church into a tourist attraction, a museum of sorts. And Jesus weeps. Why do we do that? Well, it's because we lose sight of who is commissioning us and what he commissions us to do. Jesus sets up the mission, the singular mission, the the purposeful mission from here until his coming. Our mission remains the same, and that is to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that he has taught us, And he promises to be with us every single day until the end of the age. But the mission is to make disciples, not to entertain, not to be a tourist attraction, not to be a museum. So how can we, how can we 
this family that God has put together called First Norfolk, how can we make sure that we stay the course? How, how can we make sure that we live the mission that Jesus has given us, not becoming distracted by our own uh, uh, distractions, our own detours, our, 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 our own ideas? How can we stay on track? We stay on track when we look at this passage and hear Christ's words and apply them to our lives and to our church today. If we're going to be on mission, if we're going to live the mission that Jesus has given us, if we're going to make disciples, then the first thing we need to do is we need to believe the claim that Jesus makes. You see, Jesus makes a claim before he gives a commission. He makes a claim. He gathers with his disciples, the remaining 11 and even though some of them doubt. Have you ever doubted? I mean, I have. Have you ever doubted that the gospel is enough? Have you ever doubted that what God is doing is sufficient for our lives? Have you ever doubted? Have you ever doubted that God is good? Have you ever doubted that Jesus is who he says he is? Certainly there is doubt that runs through our veins at different times as followers of Christ. But what marks us differently is that we believe even in the face of our doubt, we believe that Jesus is what he claims to be. And he has what he claims to have. The claim of Jesus, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That's not just some little intro to a speech. That is a declaration of who Jesus is. This is a declaration that Jesus Christ is the king of glory. Jesus Christ, who died for sinners upon a cross, was raised from the dead, is about to be exalted to the right hand of the throne of God, has claim over everything on this earth and in the spiritual realm. All the angelic hosts of heaven and all the demonic horde of hell, Jesus has authority over them all. Every inch of this universe, every inch of my life, Jesus has authority over it all. Every aspect of First Baptist Church Norfolk does not belong to the deacons nor the tribes that we have concocted, nor to the pastor, nor to the staff, but it belongs to Jesus. He is the one who has the right and the power to decide, to determine, to direct, and to give the orders that we, we, we must follow. He is sovereign. He is supreme. He is Lord over all. Do you believe the claim that Jesus makes? He has all authority. That's all, not partial, all. He has all authority. That means he is supreme in his sovereignty. He's not surprised by pandemics or persecution. He is supreme in his sovereignty. And he has all authority. There's a difference between authority and power. We believe that Jesus is omnipotent. We believe he has all power, don't we? But authority is different than power. Authority, where power is the competency, the skill, the ability to do certain things, authority is is the one who rules all the power. You think of it like this. On a football field, different players on the team get on the field and they play their game and they're the ones with the skill, the competency, or the ability. But it's the referee who has the authority. With the blow of a whistle... That referee can dismantle all the efforts of any player on that field. He's the one who determines if it's a touchdown or not. He's the one who determines where to spot the ball. He's the one who determines whether or not it was an illegal hit and, they, and throw a player out because of targeting penalties. He's the one who has the authority. He might not have shoulder pads and muscles, but he has a whistle and he wins because he has authority. You and I are here today and we have abilities and we have competencies and we have skills, but friends, all of us are under the authority of Jesus. Now, why does Jesus have that authority and why should we believe him? 
Because He is the one who rescued us from hell itself. He's the one who has given us life through His death. He is the one who has forgiven our sin through His sacrifice on a cross. He is the one who has brought us into the family of God. And He is the one who has filled us with His Spirit. He is the one who has been raised from the dead. And as He stood before the eleven, and as He stands before us today, He is the glorified, conquering King of the universe. And He's proved it. He's proved it in my life, and he's proved it in history. So he is the king who gives us the marching orders. He's not the one who gives us suggestions about what we ought to do. He is the one with the authority to tell us exactly what to do. I think sometimes we miss that in the church because we're, especially in the American church, American church, we're a democratic kind of congregation, at least Southern Baptists are. And because we're democratic in our congregational polity, we, send, we, we sometimes believe that the power and the authority rests with us. There is nothing further from the truth, my friends. This church exists under the authority of Jesus. And there is no power. There is no uh, uh, cabal. There is no co- coercive force that has authority above Jesus. He has authority. Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, based upon his authority, we must obey the commission he gives us. We must pursue the priority of making disciples. That's what he says. Now, just read it. And again, we're going to spend a lot of time on Really, two verses. Why? Because these two verses have given the marching orders for every church that belongs to Jesus since he spoke them on a hillside outside of Galilee. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Therefore, as you go, make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I've taught you, and behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Do you see the mission of the church as it's expressed in verse 19 and the first part of verse 20? Do you see the mission of the church? I, it, it, it just, it, it's, it's clear. It's like, it's like a club that's been created uh, to grow in fishing ability. And you uh, are in this fishing club, and people gather together because they're fishermen, and they love to go fishing. And so they get together, and, and they spend time talking about fishing, but uh, they talk about fishing so that they can fish, and they can catch fish when they go fishing and enjoy the experience even more than just catching fish because fishing is more than just catching fish, in case you didn't know. And so it, here this club is. They get together, and they get together every week, and they talk, and then they go fishing, and they're having a grand time fishing, and it's a great experience fishing but over time they stop fishing they just continue to talk about fishing and they spend all their time talking about fishing but they don't fish they get together uh, for the barbecue and they get together for the fellowship they get together for the uh, the dance at the end of the season but they never go fishing that club has lost its purpose because they started pursuing something other than the priority of their charter. Friends, the charter of the church is to make disciples. And I'm always afraid, always concerned that we, First Norfolk, this family, that we forget the purpose of our charter and the priority that Jesus has given us. And we get together for the barbecue. We get together for the fellowship. And if we weren't Baptists, we would get together for the dance at the end of the season. Although I've seen that Baptists do drink and they do dance. I've seen that. That may be a shock to you online. Why why do we lose the priority? Because we fail to take seriously that the king has given us marching orders. 
And we fail to take seriously what it means to carry those marching orders out. The command in this passage is to make disciples. That means that we are called to know him, know Jesus, to become like Jesus, and to help others know Jesus and become like Jesus. That's our mission. You want to keep it simple? I know him, and I want to make him known. That, that, that's, that's our job. That's why we exist. And that begins when we start sharing the gospel. And you knew I was going to talk about this, but guys, listen. If, if we're going to, as Tim preached last week, if, if we're going to be salt of the earth and light of the world, we need to tell people about Jesus. We need to tell people how good he is and how great he is. We need to share with them the rescuing love of the Savior who purchased me off the chopping block of my own rebellion against God, who died on a cross in my place and for my sin so that I could be forgiven. And he covered me with his righteousness so that I might be fit for God's family. Guys, listen, I used to be a stranger of the promises of God. I used to be separate from the family of God. But now, through faith in Jesus Christ, repenting my sin, receiving Jesus as my only hope, I am now a son of the God who has made me. I am now part of his family. No longer am I separated, but God in his grace drew me to himself and through faith in Christ invited me to sit at his table, to put his royal robe on me, to put his signet ring upon my finger. And he says to me, Eric, you are mine. And yet I know a lot of people who are not yet followers of Jesus. They may be attenders of church. They may be moral in their own uh, conduct as they define morality, but they are not yet followers of Christ. They haven't placed their trust in Jesus as their only hope for rescue in this life or in eternity. They have not submitted themselves under the rescuing love of Jesus Christ. They haven't declared openly, I'm a follower of Christ. I'm part of God's family. And today, if that's who you are, I invite you to embrace Jesus. Jesus to receive the forgiveness that only God can provide through the death that only Jesus could die to give you the forgiveness that you desperately want in life. I invite you to come to Jesus through faith and repentance, letting go an old life and taking hold the new life that Jesus has purchased for sinners like you and me. There was a day when I was separated from God, but... I saw Jesus as my only hope, and I turned to Jesus, and I said, Jesus, I believe that you have all authority. I believe you are who you say you are. I believe you died for my sin in my place upon a cross. I believe that you are my only hope through your death and through your resurrection. This is what I need. I need a life in the family of God. Oh, Jesus, will you forgive my sin? Will you take hold my heart? Will you rule my life? And on that day when I placed my faith in Jesus, on that day when I called out to Christ and said, rescue me, on that day God invited me into his family and he said, now, Eric, you belong to me. Now, you are my own. Now, live in the fullness of my family. And we must share that with others. Discipleship begins with evangelism. You've got to tell people. You've got neighbors and friends. You know, family members, co-workers. They don't know Jesus. And the mission that God gives you and me, this church, is to tell them. God loves you and he has a purpose for your life. Your sin separates you from God. But God sent Jesus to rescue you through his death on the cross for your sin in your place. Be raised from the dead to give you a chance at a new life. Will you today repent your sin and place your faith in Jesus? Will you become a disciple? We've got to share the gospel. Making disciples means we share the gospel. Making disciples is mobile. Here's the thing. So much of church up to the coronavirus was come and see, come and see, come and see, come and see, come and see. 
I like come and see. I do. I enjoy that. But friends, when Jesus said, go, he's giving us something different than just come and see. Listen, Jesus is not calling the church to tell the world, come and see. Jesus is calling the church to be a going church for the coming Christ. He's calling us to go on his behalf, to walk across the cul-de-sac, to travel across the nations, to walk across the office, to walk across the classroom, to go. Making disciples means going, not just sitting and soaking, right? Making disciples means that we mark new believers through baptism. We mark new believers as followers of Jesus. I, I know that, that uh, many of us have uh, put baptism as a church thing. It's a denominational thing. It's a Baptist thing. Friend, baptism is not a Baptist thing. It is a Bible thing. Jesus said, go make disciples, baptizing them. What is baptism about? Baptism is a demonstration, a declaration. It is aligning ourselves as followers of Jesus. It's coming out. It is, it is coming out of the spiritual closet and saying, I belong to Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus. It's raising the banner of Christ above our head and say, here I am. I follow Christ. I belong to him. He is my Savior. He is my King. And if you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus and you've never been baptized as a believer, today's the day for you to go ahead and say, it's time for me to raise my banner. Baptism doesn't make us part of the family of God. It just declares it to everybody. Uh, through baptism, we, we initiate ourselves in the family of God and we take upon ourselves this commitment, this, this covenant, and say, I will obey Jesus. I will follow his rescuing rule in my everyday life. I look around this room. Some of you need to be baptized. 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 We mark disciples through baptism. Making disciples is sharing the gospel. Making disciples is mobile. Making disciples is marking disciples through baptism. Making disciples is teaching obedience to Jesus as a new way of life. See, discipleship is not just uh, one and done. It's not just, oh, I, I'm saved, therefore I now can live any way I want to. No, being a disciple of Christ means that we are covered in the dust of our teacher. It means that we follow after him. It means that we learn how to live from him. Jesus said that, that we are to teach, teach them to observe, to keep, to obey all that I've taught you. Everything. Every jot and tittle. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, we hear that all Scripture is given in inspiration of God and is, is profitable for reproof and, and correction, instruction in righteousness, that you and I might be thoroughly equipped for every good work that God has prepared for us. Being a disciple means that we obey the Word of God. We, we obey the, the, the instruction of Jesus. We embrace a new way of life. It's a biblical way of life. It's, it's living according to what God's Word says, not what culture says. It's living according to what God's Word says, not why, what my emotions say. It's living according to the lifestyle that Jesus lived. It's following in His footsteps. And it's our job to grow as disciples. By the way, you're, you're, you're not perfect in your obedience, neither am I. So part of making disciples is being a disciple. It's, it's always growing and always learning, always, always uh, growing in obedience. By the way, can I tell you what we've done is we've said, we see the word teaching and we think, oh, you're going to give me some instructions. All I have to do is go through a course. No, teaching is not information only. Teaching is transformation. Teaching is where I become like the one who is teaching me. It's where I adopt his attitude, his action, his heart, his passion. It's where I become like Jesus. And that's what I'm supposed to be doing. And that's what I'm supposed to be helping others do. 
That's what you're supposed to be doing. And that's what you're supposed to be helping others do. It's not a program. It, it's, it's not, it's not a, 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 a mathematical statistics course that you take in college. It's a lifestyle where I embrace the will of God revealed by Jesus and His Word. And by the way, it's not just obeying the words that we like in Scripture. Jesus is the one who has all authority, not us. We do not have editorial authority to adjust what the author has written. Although sometimes we'd like to. To obey all that Jesus has has, uh, revealed to us is to obey from Genesis to Revelation, from beginning to end, teaching them to observe all. So Jesus has all authority, and he commissions us to make disciples of all nations. He tells us to teach and to grow in obeying all that he has taught us, that seems really hard, doesn't it? And and I would have to say it is hard because I get distracted from the mission that Jesus has given us, me. I'm pretty confident you do. I know our church does. We get distracted by other things. We, We start focusing on things that are lesser than the priority that Jesus has given us. And those are the things that we complain about. Oh, uh, uh, Eric, you, you didn't do this or you didn't do that. Or uh, don't you understand? This is what I want. I get all that. I really do. I understand. I feel and understand where you're coming from. But friends, I got to tell you, as a pastor, my priority is to make sure that we, the church, pursue the priority, the mission. We're not a luxury liner for our entertainment. We're a ship made for battle, carrying troops to advance the kingdom of God around the world. We believe the claim that Jesus makes. He has authority, all authority, so we're going to submit to that. We pursue the priority of making disciples. The last thing I just share is the last phrase that Jesus shared. We, we need to live in the comfort that Jesus promises and provides. We, we need to live in this comfort that he says in the last phrase. It, it, it's the very last phrase. He says, behold, 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 I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Here's, here's good news. Here's comfort for us. In the midst of pandemics or plagues, in the midst of persecution or opposition, in the midst of, of a government on our side or a government not on our side, in every single circumstance, we don't have to fret. Why? Because Jesus Christ, who has all authority, is with us every single day until the end of time. Can I tell you, that's really what this passage says. It says always in the King James, New King James, but literally in the Greek it says, it says, I am with you every single day till the end of time. Do you realize that Jesus is with you? He's with me. It's not some distant deity out there somewhere, but he is with us. If you remember in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, uh, when, when, when the angel talked about Jesus being born, he said, you'll call his name Emmanuel, which is translated what? God with us. And now at the end of the book, Matthew says, Jesus declared, I am with you. God with us every single day through ups and downs, through valleys and through heights of joy. He is with us. The king of creation who conquered death, hell, and the grave, who stills the storm, who gives protection. He is with us. But we've got to follow him. He holds out his hand to carry us. He he lifts us up and he moves us forward to accomplish his purposes. But we, we must yield to him. He is with us. We're not alone. And Jesus promises to live out the good shepherd psalm 
in our everyday life. This is his promise to us. The commission is to make disciples the comfort. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Jesus leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. His rod, his staff, they comfort me. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies and he anoints my head with oil. And because of Jesus, my cup runs over. Surely, without a doubt, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Jesus has given us our marching orders. The king has spoken. How will we respond? Would you bow your heads with me, please? In this moment, I just want to encourage you as a follower of Jesus, first and foremost, to commit yourself. Will you commit yourself to believe the claim of Jesus and submit to his authority? Will you obey the commission that he gives us Will you commit to making disciples? Share the gospel. Going to your neighbor, your friend, or to those who are far from God. To be baptized and help other disciples mark their allegiance to Jesus through baptism. Obeying what Jesus has taught and helping others do the same to walk a new way of life we love the promise of the personal and perpetual presence of Jesus in our lives we love that promise but friends as we hold to that comfort Let's not be disobedient and rebellious to the King. Will you commit today to make disciples? This is our mission. This is my mission. Now, Father, in these moments as we worship you through song, I pray that you would compel us by your Spirit, according to your Word, compel us to make disciples of all nations as we go, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that you've taught us And it's in the name of Jesus we pray.